So, hi, I'm Grant. I'm an undergrad um, in this lab, and I work on uh, CubeSat ADAX systems, um, Attitude Determination Control Systems. Um, today, I'm just going over a little bit of what I've been doing for this like last year or so. Um, so this summer through an REU program, I was working on creating a very simple um, CubeSat ADAC system, including the simulation software that goes with it, um, the avionics and the test bed uh, to create like a full system. So today I'm just giving a little presentation on very informal um, on building uh, CubeSat ADX from scratch. But this is only part one, so I'm going to talk about the simulation, uh, so the orbital and pointing simulation, and the avionics. Um, and passing around right now is the actual hardware. This isn't the flight hardware, but that's uh, a Manitorker board. And we'll do a little like live demo of how it works and all. Um, so if people don't know, this is Sapling. Um, it flew on Transporter 6 um, last month, or I guess this month on the 3rd. Um, Unfortunately, it didn't get deployed from its rideshare vehicle, so it is like fully charged and on, well, it's off, but it's fully charged in there and will probably just float in space for the next five years. 12. Um, <laughs> 12, 12 years, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Um, What's the altitude? It was 525, but the orbital projected lifetime for the orbiter vehicle is 12 now. Yeah, so it'll be in there for 12 years. Um, luckily, however, um, this board, or the modified flight version of this board, is flying on Transporter 7, somewhere between um, late April and late June. Um, so everything that we had on Sapling, and, and additionally, this new ADAX that I'm going to talk about today, um, will be on this next satellite, which is Sapling 2. Okay, so unlike a lot of missions that SLAB does and like professional missions, um, SSI, instead of having mission-defined system parameters, we more have satellite-defined system parameters. Um, so while we have like some pointing goals and things like that for attitude, um, a lot of it is honestly defined by um, budget, also like what's already available, and timeline. So right now we have a pretty crazy timeline. We have to deliver um, our next CubeSat by February 20 to 30, 30th. Um, and so this basically means that instead of taking a ton of time to create some mission defined parameters, um, we got to use what we have. So this basically includes the most basic data system that we can create. So we're using a magnetometer on board to get one bearing angle, um, sun sensors on board, which you can actually see on the board going around. It's these little chips right here, and they give an ambient uh, light reading. So we have one on each side, and from that we can get a solar angle. With magnetometer, we can get our other angle, so we can get um, an attitude of knowledge from that, a rough knowledge. Um, and then control-wise, we haven't had time to implement um, reaction wheels yet, so we're focusing on a solid-state system that doesn't move, because that's a lot, um, I guess, more complicated control-wise, but way more simple in the development-wise. Um, so we're doing magnetic-only control. Um, and some things to note that we have an extremely limited power supply, so each side panel right here only produces one watt at a time. Um, if we're a little bit lucky and we have two sides facing or three sides facing, we get a little bit more power, like 1.2 watts. Um, and the other thing is the geometry makes it a little bit harder because we have these access ports here as well as a GPS antenna on this side and the opposite side and a uh, UHF antenna here for telemetry and communication. So with all these parameters, it kind of defines and makes the problem a little bit harder making an ADAX system compared to if you could just put in a full ADAX into a CubeSat with a bunch of reaction wheels and all of that and as much power as you want. So how did I kind of go about doing this? So um, first up on the orbital simulations. Um, so over the summer, I'm working in Julia because Julia is pretty fast. Um, it's open source, so unlike MATLAB, anyone can just download it and use the software. And it also has some really cool visualiza visualization packages that um, are built in and free. Um, so I basically tried to simplify the orbital simulations uh, software, so you can just define an orbit, give it a start time, a duration, and a step size, and it will go through and um, of anyone who's taken A279A, it's pretty similar where it'll create the ECI, and then you can turn that to ECEF. Um, and put that in the geodetic and get all the way to ground passes. And so the big thing about this software is 
it's one being used for the ADAX to figure out um, where I am in the ECI, it'll then give you your expected magnetic field readings, and from the magnetometer, you can compare those and get um, your magnetic angle compared to your body angle. Um, but the other thing that's really important about this orbital simulation software is that when we launch uh, sapling or anything like that, we can propagate the orbit using this and predict the ground passes at all the different uh, ground stations that we have um, across the country and across the world, actually. I think we have one outside the US, um, but we're a part of a network of ground stations that are also outside the US. Um, so this is the first part of it. Um, the second part of something that I implemented is I have GMAT simulation validation for all the orbital simulation. Um, so the thing is, is a lot of the software and like methods that I learned in AHS-79A are more approximations of different like more realistic algorithms. So for example, um, this is GMAT's ECEF error comparison to the code that I originally wrote. And so you can see here it's off by about 20 kilometers um, at different points. And this is just because I was using an approximation in the beginning. But after getting rid of that approximation, this goes down to a few meters at a time. But this is a really powerful tool because just with one line, you can just say GMAT run in the same orbital parameters. And you can test how all your different disturbances are doing, so J2, J4, all that, um, solar radiation pressure, and so forth. And I'm extending this right now to go into the attitude simulation software. Um, so basically, all of the simulation is verified by GMAT um, to make sure it's correct. But what you can do is you can run a lot of different simulations at once to get some optimized values, and then use that finally, the final optimized um, simulation, and check it with GMAT to make sure it's correct. Um, so, next up, attitude simulation. Um, so, to simulate um, <coughs> sapling's attitude, we basically get the inertial uh, inertia tensor from um, our CAD software using all of our defined parts. And from that, um, I implemented a pretty basic uh, quaternion and Euler angle uh, parameterization. And you can propagate the orbit through. And the really cool thing about this, um, which I will show here is you can actually um, animate all this. So all these graphs are animations and like able to be um, messed around with. So um, for example, for the orbit plotting, you can go around and it'll tell you like what the different time is for each point. And you can go over and zoom in to your different locations. There we go. But for the pointing, what's really cool is you can actually animate your entire um, body. And so here's an animation of just a simple 3U CubeSat with the panels out um, and the body and uh, principal axes. And you can go through and animate the entire orbit like this. But you can also go down and you can animate the body in its orbit as the attitude progresses. So, for example, the little tiny line here is the ECI orbit, and then you have your RTN frame, which is going along the orbit, as well as your body and principal frame, and it'll go along. So, it's pretty basic uh, simulation, but the nice thing about this is you can verify that it's doing what you would expect it to, um, and it's just a really nice visualization um, and checkpoint. But the real validation of it goes through the GMAT software. Um, so yeah, yeah. So this is the simulation back side, and there's a lot of extra things that I'm preparing with this, and I'm basically making this its own Julia package. So you can just uh, import the Julia package, and from this you could say um, like propagate orbit, propagate attitude, with really simple parameters, and makes it so that people can just access it at any time and have all these plotting tools where you can say like plot attitude over however many days, and then it'll, pl it'll put out an animation like that. Um, it also has all your different transforms that you would want, as well as um, things such as your uh, sun vector, if you want your solar vector, and magnetic field readings and all of that. Um, so this is the first part of simulation to be able to actually run this. Um, the next part is the hardware. <coughs> so I know this last part is like a little bit more towards slab, and this is like Slab doesn't do as much hardware, um, but we want to basically get this running in space and in a few months um, and actually flight test it. Um, 
So the hardware development kind of goes through a process of first you have to design the board on, we use KiCad, which is just like a, an eCAD software where we can make our own circuit boards. Um, and then you put that out to a board factory. So we either use Bay Area circuits, which is in the Bay Area, or JLC circuits, which is in China. Um, they print out our circuit boards with nothing placed on them. We then um, basically put it like this, and we put a, a plate over it that has little holes for wherever we want the solder to go. We put paste over it, and then place each part individually by hand. Um, we actually have a machine that will like pick up the part, find the location, and place it for us. But right now it's broken um, because they changed the lab location of it, um, and people are just like going over and touching it, which uh, like destroys the calibration of it. So we're buying our own system for it and setting it up in shops so no one will touch it. Um, so right now we're hand placing everything because that part is out of commission. Um, but once you hand place it, you put it into an oven and then it bakes. Every All the parts stick to it and solder on and then you can actually test it. Um, so going around is this part, which is the side panel board. Right here is where the six side uh, solar panels go. Um, this is that light sensor that I was talking about. And then finally, this is the circuit that drives the coils that are inside of here. Um, so, and this is our flight computer, um, which is PiQ based off of, um, it's a modified version of a different flight computer that was developed here about like four or five years ago. Yeah, so um, how to basically make a magnet torquer inside of a PCB. So, um, a lot of people in most satellites have uh, magnet torpers that are centered around like a solid piece of metal and an actual wire that's coiled around. Um, this is like, that's a great method, but the thing that's hard with that is it's pretty structurally complicated. Um, you have to like have different trade-offs between that um, versus if you put it into a PCB, you can literally put it right behind your solar panels um, and not need to worry about it that much. All you need to worry about is actually the thickness of the board. So. If you see this board is a little bit thicker and it's actually because it's um, four of these coil boards with the coils inside and one final board which is uh, has all the solar panels and everything on it. Um, and so to make something like this, you could like manually draw every single one of these coils but that would be horrible and take a long time. Um, so basically I created um, a design and optimization software that plots the different um, magnetic moments versus how much power they take. So we have lines here that the resistance of all the coils together, the resisted power loss, the current, and finally the magnetic moment. So you're basically trying to increase your magnetic moment as much as you can to create your strongest magnet worker. But your trade-off there is both power um, as well as your thickness. So if you made a really, really thick coil, it would be really efficient. It wouldn't use that much power, but you just couldn't fit it in the satellite. Um, so you need to do all these trade-offs. And the other thing is that you can only create a board that has a certain amount of layers of these guys. And so you have to make choices of, okay, how many of these layers do I want in parallel and series? And all of that goes together into this big optimization problem. Um, so I create a script that basically does that, like automates that optimization and then imports those values over to KeyCAD and automatically draws all the coils. So in the end, it ends up drawing about 1,500 traces in a second um, versus that would take like months to do. Um, and another interesting part of the optimization is that the actual board house that you send it off to, they'll have their own requirements. And so they'll say that the, the distance between each trace can only be to a certain tolerance, um, as well as the thickness of the trace can only be as small as possible as they can do, so the width the height of it, so the actual like thickness of the trace is also dependent on all those parameters. So if you have a thicker trace, it's better for the magnetic field, but you have a lower tolerance. So you can you have to make larger traces, which means you can fit less coils in one board. So there's all these different parameters, and on top of that, you have to make sure that you have enough space to hold all of your antennas and access ports. And so this kind of automates that and makes it a lot, lot easier than doing it all by hand. Um, yeah, so now the fun part is I can kind of show um, with an app on my phone how it basically runs, and it's extremely simple. Um, so I guess it's already loaded on, so I'll just plug it in. Turn it on. Um, 
But so all of our side panels connect with just one connection in the back, and then they go into our flight computer, which drives all the coils and all. Um, if you have really complicated algorithms that can't fit onto our flight computer, we have a payload computer that can basically drive the Manitorker um, for more complicated control. So if you have a common filter or something like that. Um, but in this case, I'm just going to show a quick demo of it just turning on and off 10 times really fast. Um, but the nice thing about this is if you want to implement a BDOT or something like that, all you have to say is coil on off, um, and you can set at what strength you want it. Um, so here's like the magnetometer reading, and in the building right now it's like 36 micro Teslas. And if we hold it up to this guy, it's pulsing on and off right now. No, it's not plugged in. But uh, you'll see it. Oh, it's going here. Yeah, it's going. There you go. Yeah. So it'll pulse. Right now, the code basically has it so it's pulsing on and off. Oh, no, Siri. Siri, There you go. And then it's going in the opposite direction. So you have uh, both control um, directions. So you can see it's going on and off. And it must have already done the first 10 before it got there. Um, but just to show the code a little bit, it's extremely simple. Um, and we basically made it so that you can basically say magnet torquer, you can set the voltage, so how strong you want it, and you can set the mode. So this is basically forward mode versus backward mode. And the nice thing about this is you have two coils. You have a coil on each side panel, so each dimension has two different controls. So if you want a really strong uh, direction, you can set both on high, you can set one on half, and so you get this nice, um, kind of range of what you want your magnetic field to be. Um, and if one dies, you still have redundancy in every single direction. Um, yeah, so one interesting thing was the debugging process honestly takes way longer than the simulation and building process. So this chip originally, instead of BD50, was BD60. Um, and so this is a five volt converter that basically takes in our battery voltage, which is too high for this motor driver chip goes through and turns it to a, a steady five volts. Before it was at six volts, because this chip is rated up to like 6.5 volts. Um, but there's a ton of things in like the hardware process that make it kind of difficult to you know, like hit all these random bugs. And the thing was, was this chip is designed to take both logic input at 3.3 volts and five volts. Um, the flight computer is on 3.3 volt logic. Um, and so you have to tune this input voltage to get a steady signal out at whatever uh, logic level you have. So if you're at six, 3.4 volt logic works, but 3.3 volt logic doesn't work. But if you turn it back to five, all the way down to like 1.5 volt logic works. Um, but that took like three days of constant work to figure out just because it was giving random behavior. So hardware makes it a little bit more difficult, but now it's all working, um, it's good, and we get to demo it soon. So next steps in the process um, are we're going to vibe it again, see that it works um, at Quanta Labs. Um, I'm not too worried about this because we already did one vibe and it went well. Um, then the testing stage, we're going to NASA Ames on the 15th and using their SmallSat um, ADAX testing site um, with their Hemmels cage. Um, and then finally flight and seeing if it works. And the cool thing about this is that um, uh, we'll be able to upload new code to the satellite later on. So now that the hardware is already up there, I'm gonna try to implement a simple just, uh, actually Spencer and I are both gonna try to implement a simple BDOT algorithm uh, to just slow it down at first because of the timeline is just really hectic right now. But as time goes on, if it survives launch and is up there, um, we can, just upload new ADAX algorithms to it whenever we want, which will be really cool because we'll be able to test the hardware under a lot of different circumstances if everything works out. Um, and hopefully pop another champagne during launch. So, yeah. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions? Anything?